One, two, three. Welcome, everybody. My name is Ethan Roland Solovyev. Uh, you've made it to the session on regenerative enterprise and the eight forms of capital. My co-presenter, Gregory Landway, is not able to be here today, um, but he sends his regards and excitement for the regenerative enterprises that you are all going to create. Uh, so thank you for coming. I work with TerraGenesis International, which you'll hear plenty more about. You can follow us on Twitter and online and all that good stuff. So, uh, that's me. Who's here? Let me get a show of hands. How many folks here are um, permaculturalists? Okay, quite a few. That's nice. How about uh, who here, just so we get a sense of it, would say that they are an entrepreneur? Awesome. Great. Welcome. Uh, how many folks here are farmers? Great. Thank you. How many folks would consider themselves executives? Executives, executives of uh, companies. Great, thank you, welcome. Uh, how about investors? A few investors here, great. And how about, what else we got here? Who's employee of a company that's uh, bigger than one person? <laughs> you, okay, bigger than 10 people? Bigger than 100? Okay, cool, great, good to know. Um, thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to introduce some frameworks to work with. And a good bit of this is you're going to work with each other, probably just with your neighbor right next to you, uh, to actually be concretely applying what I'm presenting to your life situation and business, ideally. Um, so I'm here as part of an intersection of three organizations. One of them, as I mentioned, is TerraGenesis International, which works to regenerate global supply and global supply chains, which you'll hear lots more about. I'm also an associate of the Carroll Sanford Institute. And the Carroll Sanford Institute has 40 years of experience in corporate engagement focused on regeneration. If you think about that, that's actually about the same time or even a little longer than permaculture has been around. So right now there's a bit of a convergence of the realms of permaculture and regeneration. And most people in permaculture don't actually know the lineage of regeneration and the depth and complexity that it has. So one, of the, one, of, one piece of my purpose here is to up the level of conversation around regeneration and what it is, what it means, and how to apply it. Um, and uh, also a part here as the Regenerative Enterprise Institute, which is an uh, organization that's coming together to store the intellectual capital commons around regeneration, and especially around regenerative enterprise, regenerative supply, regenerative business. So... TerraGenesis International has a, a modest goal um, for the next 10 years. Um, that goal is to work with 100 enterprises to shift a billion dollars of purchasing power per year into fully regenerative permaculture supply sources. If we do that right, according to our calculations, that'll shift approximately 100 million acres of land into fully regenerative agriculture. Uh, and if that captures all the carbon that I know you all know how to make it do, uh, that would be enough, ideally, to reverse climate change. So, the small goal. Um, well, I might need some help, uh, and that's part of what this workshop is about. Specifically, TerraGenesis has honed in, we, we had, we've been around for five years, we've done some large-scale international landscape design, 300-acre uh, sand mine restoration in Barbados, um, uh, uh, permaculture education center in Thailand. We've noticed that just doing the landscape design itself isn't quite enough of a leverage point for us. And so we've shifted to working with enterprises, with companies, uh, with governments. We haven't yet, but we'd be up for it. So our focus is on companies with global supply chains. And I'm putting that in quotes for a reason that you'll understand a little later. Um, companies that have in their portfolio of supply anywhere from one to a thousand materials. You could go bigger than that too. Uh, raw agricultural materials from multiple different climates, from the tropics, from the cold tempera, from the Mediterranean, from the desert. We're also interested in mineral and uh, synthetic materials. Anselm and I were talking about that earlier. What would regenerative mining look like? How many people here have a computer or a smartphone? Put your hands up. <laughs> okay, so you too should be interested in the question of what does regenerative mining look like? How could that even... How could that even exist? Um, in order to work with an enterprise, 
we require someone in the C-level suite, the corporate executives, uh, or at least somebody at the business unit level, that's somebody who is, has a, uh, a bottom line, has a profit and loss statement that they manage. We need someone at that level, uh, otherwise there won't be enough buy-in, there won't be enough excitement, and the work can't really move forward. So uh, we work with companies that have that level of interest in, not in regeneration, not in permaculture, but in effective, profitable, and resilient operations of their company. We don't necessarily need people who are into green or into quote unquote sustainability. Often CSR departments, corporate social, corporate sustainability uh, and responsibility is this like separate department, it's this other thing that's not integrated into the business. I don't need to sell to those people, I don't need to work with them. What we need is people who are interested in effective, profitable, and resilient operations because if you actually head towards a regenerative enterprise, these things start to improve in the business is what uh, I found in my last couple of years working with this and what the Carol Sanford Institute has found over 40 years working with companies. Uh, when she goes in and Carol Sanford starts working on regeneration, profits increase to 25 to 60 percent per year over a string of years. So just as a little selection of some of our clients who we're working with, uh, Etsy.com is the online marketplace global business. They have a new foundation that's working on regenerative business education. We're working on them. Uh, Lush Cosmetics, who may have heard from Simon Constantine yesterday, we're working with the North American company of Lush Cosmetics, but also with Lush UK. Uh, and then Chalaka, and we'll talk about both of these in more detail, which is a chocolate drink manufacturer. Why do we work on enterprise? I do not necessarily think that financial capital should be the dominant force that controls how everything happens in the world. But it is, currently, is my belief. And therefore, if I want to find a acupuncture point where I can put a little bit of energy and shift the whole flow in the system, I need to go to what's currently moving and dominating and shifting the world. Uh, and that is financial capital, and that is business. And therefore, I choose to work on enterprises as opposed to on landscape, as opposed to on education, because I think it's a, a systemic spot where we can use some really high quality systems thinking and regenerative thinking to shift a lot very quickly. Um, much like Jeff was talking about this morning, you know, going around teaching a 30 person PDC here and there, that's great. But when I started working with Lush Cosmetics and the CEO said, can you train all 4,000 of our employees in permaculture this year? I said, yeah, sure, let's do it, let's go. And it's, it's done, it's like that. Right? So there's a significant leverage in working with enterprises that have the financial capital resources to make things move. And that's where I choose to work there. For you, I would like you to choose an enterprise that you're going to work with for the remainder of this session. So I want you to first think to yourself of an enterprise <coughs> that you are personally influential in. Doesn't necessarily mean you need to be the executive, uh, but some enterprise that you actually have some personal control over or influence in. And if a couple are popping up for you, Choose the one that has the greatest influence in the world. Okay, so everybody think about that for a second. Could you just define any surprise? Sure, anybody else want to give a swing at that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm happy to do it, but it's easy for me to do. It's more interesting if you think about it for a minute. Mm -hmm. Is the permaculture movement an enterprise? No, it's not. I don't, I don't consider it. Um, enterprise. What's the, the etymology of enterprise? Undertake. Yeah, what's that mean? It means to undertake something. To undertake something. To take something on. So, essentially, I define an enterprise as an undertaking. A project that has, uh, usually, actually, the definition says an undertaking that is, basically, it says something like it has a challenge that must be overcome. So, we use enterprise because it's inclusive of business of NGOs, of little charities, of many different things can be considered an enterprise. And uh, we're especially interested in larger scale enterprises that are companies and corporations for our work, but this works for any enterprise. Okay, turn to your neighbor and just confirm with them that you have an enterprise that you're going to think about that you're personally influential in, and just tell them and we'll come back. <laughs>
job. That was a very quick quiet down, which we're going to need if we're going to get through everything. So nice job. Everybody got an enterprise? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the first framework I want to share with you today is called the regenerative continuum. This is a, a very basic two-term framework that we use to think about and just get people to understand just to start to think about the concept of regeneration. In this uh, continuum, we've got degenerative one on one side. That's destructive, extractive, decreasing the overall potential and possibility of whatever it is you're looking at. On the far end is regenerative. Regenerative is growing and increasing the overall potential and possibility of the situation. It's repairing, healing, restoring, and improving and going beyond what was already done. So if you have a continuum that looks like this, where does sustainability fall? Somewhere, mas or menos, more or less, in the middle here. And yet, sustainability is put out as this big goal all over the place right now. I don't think sustainability is enough. What is it we're going to sustain right now? Is it climate chaos? Peak oil? Mass extinction of species? Is that what we're sustaining? Right. So what we think... Um, would somebody be willing to close that window? That would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Regenerative asks us to go beyond. It's a little bit like Zen and the Art of Archery. If you're aiming for the target, you won't actually hit the bullseye. You have to aim at a spot 300 yards through the target but beyond it. And you might get there on the way. Right? So we aim and ask our clients and everyone we work with to step beyond sustainability and actually think about what would it be like to regenerate this whole system? Frameworks are incredibly valuable for evolving our thinking. Jeff talked this morning about um, the current crisis, the current challenge is an opportunity for us to evolve as humans. If we're going to do that, it means we have to actually have to change our minds and how they work. And I've found that frameworks are a great way to do that. A framework is very different than a model. Everybody's talking about model, we've got to build a replicable model. Right? That's from a machine paradigm where you're creating replicable little parts that all look the same. This is not a model. Models don't come from whole living systems. Frameworks are lenses through which to look. They're ways to look through and understand the world that have the capability to push and evolve and shift your thinking. One framework that I've found really core to all my work on enterprise is this one called the Eight Forms of Capital. How many folks have seen this before this moment? Okay, a few, good. Um, I'll lay it out briefly. Uh, it's the main subject of a book I wrote two years ago called Regenerative Enterprise, which you can get online for free or you can pay something for it if you want. Um, you can get it digitally or a hard copy, whatever you like, regenterprise.com. That'll be up at the end. Eight forms of capital comes from noticing that there is one form of capital that the current world runs on, it's financial capital. This is money, right? Uh, however, there are other forms of capital that are in effect, that are acting, that are shifting, changing, transacting at all times. And if our map is solely based on financial capital and a single bottom line, we're not going to be taking into account the complexity of the whole living systems in which we exist. This map helps to see more. Along with financial capital, there's also material capital. That's this desk here. It's my computer. It's the clothes we're wearing. It's uh, timber, stone, steel, non-living physical things that can be complexed into infrastructural capital, like this building we're sitting in, or a car, or a bridge. Financial capital and material capital are a significant part of the current global economy. There's also, somewhat well known, is social capital. Social capital is influence and connections between people. Right? Social capital, you can often buy social capital with financial capital. And social capital can also be transformed into financial capital if you know the right people. All of these miss and live out what I believe is the foundational form of capital on the planet, which we call living capital instead of natural capital. Living capital is the soil, it's the carbon, it's the water, it's the organisms, it's the genetic diversity in your herd or on your farm. This living capital in the current system is extracted, compacted, destroyed to transform into ever-growing amounts of financial and material capital. This current trend has to shift. Two other forms of capital that are useful to think about are intellectual and experiential capital. Now, they're different. 
Intellectual capital is knowledge, ideas, it's explicit information. You're getting intellectual capital when I speak. When you read a book, I read a book once on straw bale building, so I know how to build a straw bale house now, right? <laughs> no, not at all. Right? I, have no, I have some intellectual capital, I have some ideas, but I have zero experiential capital in how to actually do it. Great teachers can transform experiential capital, embodied wisdom and know-how, into intellectual capital and share it explicitly. And then, if everything goes well, you have then have the opportunity to ground that intellectual capital into your experience and make it real for you. There are other maps of capital out there. <laughs> Bless you. Um, but they usually, and some of them have some of these pieces, but they usually leave out these last two. One of them is spiritual capital. And spiritual capital has many different forms for every different being. Um, some religious traditions have explicit understandings of spiritual capital. Buddhism has karma, which is a form of spiritual capital that you can actually uh, develop over lifetimes. Some other communities, like the Tsutihil Maya in Guatemala, uh, or in what we now call Guatemala, have a sense of spiritual debt that is a debt to reality that we each incur coming in, and they spend much of their lives creating beauty in order to repa repay the debt to the world. Um, spiritual capital, in whatever form it is, for some people it's faith and prayer, uh, I believe exists and is useful to me. All of these are forms of capital that one can develop on your own, more or less, but this last one is something that actually has to be held by a group of people, and we call that cultural capital. Cultural capital is the ability of a community to step into shared ceremony together. It's the shared songs, the stories, the myths, the food, the language that holds a community and culture together. Living, cultural, social, and spiritual capital are what we call the four nurture capitals. These are the four that are generally destroyed, extracted, in order to create ever-growing amounts of financial and material capital, using intellectual and experiential capital to facilitate the transfer. One of the principles we write about in our book is uh, you have to shift that fundamental flow and reinvest financial capital into living capital. That's not surprising to you as permaculturists. However, uh, putting it in a language that includes the word capital, which anybody in the business world understands and has a connection with, um, makes it so that this is available, digestible, it's a, it's a conversation starter. That's part of why it's formulated this way. So uh, the work of a regenerative enterprise is to ongoingly develop the quality, especially, and somewhat the quantity of multiple forms of capital. I want to optimize for multi-capital abundance. And I want to just ground that sort of theoretical overview of a framework with uh, an example from one of our clients, which is uh, Lush Cosmetics. And then we'll have you work on your own enterprise through it. So Lush Cosmetics, a fresh handmade cosmetics company, started here in the UK, but now uh, has uh, branches in, it's not quite a branch, sister companies in North America, Australia, and Japan. Uh, I know North America best because we work directly with them, with their global buying team and their sustainable Lush Fund team. Uh, they have over 4,000 employees in North America, 220 stores. They're a very, very interesting company, amazing company. They have, uh, they do no paid advertising or marketing. Uh, they don't have any middle management. Um, and they're wildly successful. They never discount their stuff. And uh, they believe in some really incredible things. They use fresh ingredients. Going into their factories is kind of like going into a kitchen. Right? You've got the little immersion blender at home that you blend up a soup or something with. They have those too, they're a little bit bigger, but it's still one person blending up fresh mango pulp and blueberries and cocoa butter to make a face mask that you put on, but when you get it in the store, it has a shelf life of 28 days. And so they actually believe in creating fresh handmade ingredients. They have a huge charitable givings program. They have a really strong vegetarian, vegan stance uh, that I don't always agree with, but I understand is a huge part of the meaning and story of the company. They don't package any of their stuff. A lot of their stuff comes naked. Uh, so it's a very fascinating company to work with. Their global supply chain stretches around the entire world and has over 500 ingredients. Probably more, I actually don't know the number, but probably over $50 million in purchasing power every year. That's for the ingredients that they buy to make into their products to then sell. Um, 
50 million? Pff, don't quote me on that. I don't know exactly. A lot. In the millions, many millions range. They came to us and said, would it be possible for us to uh, purchase all of our ingredients from permaculture farms mm -hmm. around the world? Can you help us do that? And we said, yeah. Sure. <laughs> we can help you do that. But um, uh, there's not enough permaculture farms in the world producing enough to get even a tiny portion of what you currently use. So if you really want to have that happen, we can help you make it happen. You'll need to uh, invest. You'll need to invest into the base of productive capacity in a permaculture scenario. So um, I work on something that Simon spoke to yesterday that was really crafted by Simon and Paolo and many of the folks at the Lush UK team, and then came to North America about two years ago. Sustainable Lush Fund takes a percentage of their purchasing budget, of that however many million it is, and invests it in, through grants, loans, and actual investments into four main areas of environmental, it should really be eco-social regeneration, food security and sovereignty, enterprise financial viability, and supply chain development. And they do that across four climate zones. And there's just some sample ingredients here to get you a sense of the types of materials that they're purchasing in each of these climate zones. Um, you can write these down if you want to. There's also, I'll show you a link where you can get an even bigger list than this. So we've roughly divided things up into Mediterranean, desert, temperate, and tropics. And there's some ingredients here that we, we call keystone ingredients. Almonds, jojoba, honey, and cocoa butter. And that was some of the work that we did in the first year working with them. Uh, was finding, understanding, and investing into ecosystems of enterprises around each of these individual ingredients in different places. So we're working in California on almonds, uh, in Arizona and Mexico on jojoba, in Canada on honey, because it's so heavy, we're working right close to the factories to support the sustainable and regenerative beekeeping right around the factories to get all the honey production, uh, and then cocoa butter uh, through cacao starting in Ecuador. I do know. I made this chart, so I know exactly what it is. Um, it means these are not currently used in their products, but they're such amazing plants in a number of different ways that we said, these grow here, you might consider incorporating them. Um, here's a map of the global projects that the uh, uh, Sustainable Lush Fund has funded. Uh, so you can see it's a quite a global reach. I think it's over 50 projects in probably over 30 countries at this point. Uh, and growing more every year. And part of the thinking and part of what happens in the Sustainable Lush Fund is that they invest multiple forms of capital, it's not just financial capital. Uh, Terragenesis comes and brings um, significant intellectual and experiential capital in um, permaculture and design that will work with local partners to create in the different places. So uh, just as an example of that, Here's uh, some design work for Ecuador around living terraces, diversifying and improving the um, water holding capacity of some of the cacao landscapes in northwestern Ecuador. This is a, a design um, by somebody on our team that's looking at creating these living terraces. So we'll go through, we'll do this process. We fund project partners on the ground, so there's actually local people working on things. Uh, and then give them technical support, financial support, entrepreneurial support to carry out really excellent projects. So uh, in northwestern Ecuador at a place called Caimito, and if you want to know more about this project, would you stand up for a minute? Yes, you. <laughs> this is Luke Smith, who works with Terragenesis, um, who has lived for many years on the ground in Caimito, where this project is that I'm talking about. And he has lots more details than I do about cacao polycultures and the ecosystems there and the community there. So if you have more questions about that, Talk to him afterwards, thanks. Part of the project here is uh, working with a community work party called a Minga, uh, which is where a whole group of people come together and work on one person's farm for a day a week, and then they move to another farm, and then they move to another farm. So it'll take a whole week per month in some places and go from farm to farm with a whole bunch of communal energy. So Lush has supported uh, the meeting of these Mingas in order to take some of these ideas and beautiful pictures and actually transform them into real living terraces that will then be interplanted with a diversity of food trees and uh, heritage cacao varieties uh, from this place. Uh, the overall work here is actually heading towards developing a regenerative supply of cacao that is grown in a permaculture way but then can actually be purchased in you know, 20 metric ton container loads from the second level uh, cooperative and shipped and used in Lush products. And that's starting to happen already. 
One of the other ways that the Sustainable Lush Fund works is through these seed grants. This is a smaller, um, uh, basically they're, they're, it's like spreading little seeds. It stands for Sustainable Enterprise Ecology Development. And these are small $5,000 grants. We did 10 projects last year. We may do something similar in this next year. Um, there was supposed to be a sign-up sheet at the back of the room. If, some, if anybody's interested in getting grants like these or hearing about the opportunities when they come up from Lush or other of our similar clients in the future, if someone sends around a sign-up sheet, then I'll make sure you get the email for you or any projects you're associated with. Um, this is a quick application. It's a quick bit of money. Uh, and part of it is getting to know people, getting to know projects, and seeing if they're a fit for the larger investments and the larger, longer-term projects like the one in Ecuador. To clarify, are you talking North America, the Americas, or international? Uh, all those options are international. No, but where you're based and what you're This one goes anywhere in the world. Yeah, we funded things in Indonesia and uh, Ethiopia and South America and North America in the last round. So yeah, well, everything's, it's a North American company, but we're working internationally. Okay, so there's a little grounded example of how one company is working with multiple forms of capital, not just financial, but also uh, intellectual, experiential, and social capital. Uh, and if you have noticed, Lush Cosmetics is here at this event, funding the permaculture uh, research initiative, uh, and they're here growing social capital in the permaculture community. So they're consciously working with multiple forms of capital in the design and development of a global enterprise that is uh, profitable and doing some pretty incredible work. So now it's time to go back to you. I want you to think about your particular enterprise that you thought of at the beginning and apply some piece of the eight forms of capital framework to that enterprise and say, if I were to, if I were to start thinking about my enterprise through the lens of the eight forms of capital, how would it shift? What would change? So turn to ideally one neighbor or two if you've got it and talk about it for uh, two or three minutes each. Go for it.
somebody that we haven't heard from yet. Uh, I realized that we were already interested in the enterprise I'm thinking about, which is uh, right now an NGO, but which is becoming a company whose goal is creating thousands of little, little scale farms in France <coughs> in the next years. And we will be um, uh, creating a, an event for financial capital raising financial capital in October. And it will be a big day, but we could change a lot of things in this day if we would try to raise the eight forms of capital. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't change the project because currently we are thinking about cultural uh, part of the Right, but what would, what would change then if you went to raise more than just one form of capital? What would change? out in the world, not just in your project? Uh, not just in the project, but if you were then going out and asking for multiple forms of capital, what would happen? Everybody in the room or everywhere could help us. Not only the people who could give us yeah. money, but the, the people who could give us plans. And we need spe specific plans. There are people who could give us experience when we need it, because we are learning our job of a very little scale farm. So everyone, everyone could help us in the cool. last class. Cool, thank you. Other thoughts, reflections that came up? Um, you know, we were both uh, involved with, we worked for universities, large um, state universities in the United States. And, you know, we were looking at that they already, you know, universities generally have all of these things at play. I mean, 
yes. how much they're investing yeah. is is questionable. But but it, all this is going on, you know, there. Um, I think just on the supply, I was just talking. I was just thinking about the supply chain for a university that has a sustainability committee and all of this stuff. But then they're getting all their supplies from Cisco and you know that kind of thing. But a big problem is when you come to them and say, hey is that they need everything to come from one source. So this whole idea of like, if we have lots of little enterprises and little farms and little, that we need, just like just like the, the main factor, you know, a, a central distribution grid, which I'm sure you deal with, but how do you do this when you need 50,000 apples, you know, like tomorrow, you oh, know? Yeah. And all of this supply chain stuff, when you're dealing with these large, large organizations, that maybe would be willing and open to more regenerative ideas, but it has to actually work. Totally. So how does it work? Like so I have two <laughs> thoughts and responses. Um, the first one is the bad one, but I'll do it anyway. Um, which is that there are systems and structures being designed, and we need to design more enterprises that fill the niche that you're speaking to that doesn't exist. That's the bad answer, response. The one that I think uh, would head us more towards regenerative thinking is that the question you asked is talking about existence. It's talking about what is now and the challenges and the problems of now, which we're taught to focus on. A more regenerative approach might be to f do some design work first about who are the players in the system and do I have enough social capital with the players in the system that we need to be engaged in a conversation around the potential of what could be created. Because if we simply just respond to what people say is the problem is the problem is the problem, then we're only working on the level of existence where we are now, and the best we can do is maybe get to sustainability. If we're going to regenerate, we actually need to shift into ourselves and the people we're working with, thinking what is the potential here, and what would we all need to change and shift in order to make this work? Because I don't think, at least in some universities these days, they're, they don't hate local food and think it's a bad idea. They just have these challenges. So there's an in to say, well, let's design together. And let's think about how we could figure something out together. Maybe you need to invest in an enterprise that could play some of the roles that you're saying don't exist. OK, I'm going to move on. Thank you. One note I want to make about this framework and the next one I'm going to show you um, is, and I didn't put it on here, but uh, these are both copyrighted. Uh, which means, uh, not that I don't want this to get out in the world and be used and engaged by everyone, I want it as fast as possible, but it does mean that there's a certain integrity uh, of intellectual capital development that's gone into these, and uh, I and my colleagues don't want them to go out in the world and be turned into something that's easily used for greenwashing. Um, so if you'd like to use the A Forms of Capital or the next framework I'll show you, or anything you see from me, get in touch and let's have a conversation about it and thereby grow social capital between us to grow the integrity of an intellectual capital commons that can hold something. So I don't, it's not that I don't want it to get out there, but I want it to be held with integrity. Thank you. So let's go on to some characteristics of enterprises. I want to head towards regenerative enterprises, but here's six characteristics uh, of many enterprises over here, and a few enterprises over here that are heading in this way. So many enterprises, many enterprises have supply chains, right? and they're thinking about themselves as a single entity, a single enterprise out there competing. A few enterprises are starting to realize, wow, chains don't exist in nature. If we're going to mimic natural systems, there are no chains, there are webs. So let's go to supply webs and thinking about systems of enterprises, interconnected organisms working together. A few enterprises are heading that way. Many enterprises have a financial capital bottom line. We call it mono capital. It's a financial capital bottom line, that's it. Some companies are trying to go to the triple bottom line. And that's a great direction in some ways. However, it's still the bottom line, so it's still the last thing you look at. Uh, and it's really hard. Triple bottom line companies are hard to create profit in, in uh, three forms of capital, not let alone eight. Many enterprises have either an ignorance of their place or where they are, or even a contempt of it, a destruction of it. And some enterprises are heading towards actually understanding their place and getting a place-based sense of 
uh, where we are and actually designing either their food production or some of the ways they work based on the place they're in. That's a good direction. What do you mean by that? Um, what do I mean by that? Do you understand this part of the ignorance or contempt of place? No. Ignorance is like a company that like doesn't even know where they are, doesn't know the, the, uh, the people where they are, and are just, so for example, land grabbing in Africa. Mm -hmm. There's a significant ignorance of the people and ecosystems of the place coming in, destroying what was there, displacing people, and growing food that shouldn't be grown there to be shipped to somewhere else. A place base would say, oh, wow, this is interesting. There are some people who have been here before. There are some food growing systems that have worked here in the past. How could we maybe learn from that a little bit? Many companies, many enterprises are growth at all costs. Some other companies are a little more responsive. They're starting to think in terms of triple bottom lines. They want growth, but they don't want growth that destroys things. I'm going to keep going through these. Financial capital bottom line means we have to make a profit in money. And that's what the shareholders want to see. And everything we do is decisions towards making excess money. That's it. Triple bottom line. How does it go? I don't even think about it. Very much. People, profit, and planet, uh, social, environmental, and cultural, different things. I use a different framework. I don't like triple bottom line because it's still the last thing people think about. This needs to be integrated from the top, not at the bottom. Many enterprises uh, either accept or have a real pride of extraction and destruction, ignoring and erasing the history of their company or of their place, like just greenwashing the hell out of it. BP's got a new green thing going, right? <laughs> their logo's really green. Great. It's awesome. Right? Some, a few enterprises are heading towards brand sustainability and corporate social responsibility which are steps. There are a few more and more people who do this. There's a whole report about the top 100 sustainable companies in the world. Have anybody seen that? It's by the Knight Group. Very interesting. I think number one is Coca-Cola. Uh, number two is Blackso Smith Klein or Pfizer. Uh, they're sustainable because they're, they're planning to sustain themselves forever, which is not how natural systems work. Nothing lives forever in natural systems. Enterprises die in natural systems. We should design our enterprises to die and compost and feed the rest of the ecosystem. Many enterprises, uh, in terms of sort of messaging or branding, do a, a sort of a dictation of meaninglessness, is what I call it, um, causing a homogeneity and disempowerment of people. Some head towards this kind of message co-creation where it's very feedback-oriented, understanding, uh, hearing, uh, and moving towards human customer imperatives, what the people want and what the people think is important for them. Feedback, lots of feedback. Nothing here, in my assessment, gets us close to a regenerative enterprise. Okay. So now I want to lay out with those there, add a little bit of what I believe would take us towards being a regenerative enterprise. So as opposed to supply chains and supply webs, regenerative enterprise move towards producer webs. Where not is it just everything's trying to supply a company, but every enterprise in the whole ecosystem is producing value in multiple forms of capital for every other player in the ecosystem. Multi-enterprise reciprocal ecosystems, not systems, which are again from the mechanical paradigm that looks as humans as computers and everything as machines, but from an ecosystem perspective where there's a reciprocal relationship being developed amongst enterprises. Regenerative enterprises aim for eight capital optimization. That doesn't mean that every enterprise has to create all eight forms of capital. It does mean that every enterprise has to think of itself and design itself in an ecosystem where different players in the ecosystem are optimizing for certain forms of capital and transacting and exchanging between them so that across the whole ecosystem, all eight forms of capital are developed. Instead of place-based, it's actually something that's called place-sourced. So it's not just looking at what's there now in the place, but it's going through a full, long story of place process as is laid out by the Regenesis group, which if you don't know them, definitely check out their stuff, to understand the essence of the place 
and not just simply paying lip service to it, but sourcing the strategy of the company, the leadership of the company, and the operations from the essence of the place. Instead of growth at all costs or responsive growth, regenerative enterprises would aim for evolutionary growth from designed disturbances, purposefully stepping into disruptive, disturbing, not disturbing, but disruptive situations, and then grasping that as an opportunity for evolutionary development of the company. Uh, the first speaker yesterday talked about Earth going through these periods of massive disruption and instability before evolving, or as part of evolving. I think there's something very similar to that here. Rather than having a brand that's somehow based on sustainability or some idea of green, just like understanding the essence of a place, enterprises that can understand their own essence, their own unique singularity, and regenerate their work in the world from that uniqueness on an ongoing basis, that's regeneration. And then finally, rather than dictating meaninglessness, a regenerative enterprise would head towards actually generating meaning and regenerating the meaning with everybody involved, customers included, towards not human imperatives of what people want, but towards global imperatives. What does the, the earth want? A fully regenerative enterprise, which I haven't seen any of, would literally not just do work in their space, but would transform the industry that they're part of and change the course of history. All of my thinking here is sourced from Carol Sanford and her work for 40 years in regeneration. And uh, that's part of why the copyright's here to protect the integrity of her intellectual lineage. Um, these are not easy things to do, and they require shifting and pushing our minds to do them. So what I'm going to do is give a brief example, uh, and then have you work it a bit in your own minds, and then we'll do some questions. Uh, this is another one of our clients called Chalaka. They're based in the United States. Uh, they're a drink chocolate drink company. Um, they're not a regenerative enterprise. Uh, we've told them in working with them that they won't become a regenerative enterprise for many years because it takes a good bit of time for the thinking of the people and the ecosystems to develop where regeneration on all six of those characteristics could actually happen. But they're starting and they're moving towards it. Chalaka uses cacao. How does a cacao get from the farmer to Chalanka? This is how it usually works. First, it goes to a commercial cacao buyer who puts in a cacao warehouse who sells it to a commodities broker on the commodities market. That commodities broker sells it to another commodities broker and often several more commodities brokers before it finally gets to a cocoa processor who processes it and then sells it to Chalanka. Okay, That's the standard supply chain. So if we're going from chain to something else, what if we facilitate a resource, the cacao farmer to connect with the cacao cooperative, which then has a direct trade agreement with the company? That's nice. More value can go back to the farmer and the cooperative and doesn't get stuck in all the middle people who are here. Right? So that's chained to something different. But what if we actually went to a web? What if, along with Chalaka, Chalaka looked for, and we're working with Chalaka to do this now, other purchasers? A local processor, another chocolate maker, a local market, other companies, and supported those companies to buy significant amounts of cacao from the cooperative. It could even then, if the cooperative wanted, sell the commercial cacao buyer. Maybe relationships could even be made with the cacao farmer right to that buyer. It's not cutting them out, but it's changing the flow of the system. Even better, what if there are multiple cacao co-ops, either in the same place or in different places, and along with those different co-ops, Chalaka was purchasing from them, but also supporting them to make connections to other purchasers. Now we're starting to get more of a web. Right? Then, if Chalaka begins to invest into the cooperative, sending forms of capital back, and invest there into the cacao farmer, what would happen? So we're heading towards uh, working with Chalaka to invest into value-adding infrastructure at origin with the co-op so that the value can be uh, retained and maintained and developed 
at the origin as opposed to uh, at, you know, in a warehouse in the Netherlands, which is a lot of where cacao processing is. Actually, anyone know what room we're in? Elizabeth Fry. Anybody know anything about Elizabeth Fry? Chocolate. Chocolate. Very strange, but Fry, the Fry family was one of the original importers of cacao. Yeah. Part of the whole system. It was very funny. <laughs> so, Chalaka, to, they haven't yet, but are planning to invest in the infrastructure, building uh, structures like this, which is a, a value adding uh, cacao uh, dryer and roaster, I believe. You were there working on this. Um, which is uh, right in the center of town, uh, which is a simple structure. It's a rocket stove that's in here that could be used for more advanced value-added processing at the origin. This is like right in the town. The ocean's right over there. This is right where the cacao is grown. So if that sort of investment happens from Chalaka, that would be great. But what if also other forms of investment start to happen from some of these other players into that cooperative and other cooperatives? What if, even better, the commercial cacao buyer got the scent of something good, a good story, and decided that they were going to start investing in the cooperative and the farmer and the local processors in the local market. Now we're starting to head towards a regenerative producer world. And this hasn't happened yet, but this is, this is not based on the existence of what is now and the problems of doing that. This is ex based on the potential of where we could head. So. I just talked about how Chalaka is aiming towards some of these characteristics of regenerative enterprises with the producer webs, building multi-enterprise reciprocal ecosystems, and thinking about optimizing for different forms of capital in different places. I would like you to again turn to your neighbor and think about, maybe just choose one of them, the one you understand the most or the least, and say what would happen if I sought to move my enterprise toward the direction of these characteristics. So take a couple minutes each person and then we'll gather back. Go for it. <laughs>
let's hear a couple of reflections back from the group, things that emerged from, for you in that conversation, ideally from some folks we haven't, haven't heard from yet. Our kind of uh, question, maybe, was if our, our enterprise examples were relatively small businesses or kind of coming from a firm culture perspective and then their base is play source or all other stuff. I mean, for me, exactly kind of six capital, uh, two of them are missing out, which is what we're kind of looking for in the business or the material side. And how do we take that into a smaller framework? which doesn't have a big supply chain or doesn't. Did you have any ideas come up for how you might do that? Strengthening the capital, the two capitals that we, that are not as strong and then coming out of there and doing something bigger or more. Regenerative enterprises can be one person and small. Regenerative enterprises don't have to be big. They don't have to have a global supply chain. Our company chooses to work on global supply chains because we think that's where the leverage is. Um, but I think smaller enterprises sourced from permaculture inspiration have a much better chance at getting here sooner than larger enterprises do. So um, it sounds like you're having some specific questions around the, you said, financial and material capital side of things. And uh, I would say that you're not alone in that. My experience with the permaculture movement is brilliant ecological, social, and systems thinking. Very, very little business training, entrepreneurship background. And so uh, I see a whole bunch of people nodding their heads. <laughs> um, that's OK. Well done noticing that. Let's change it. Right? I'm not going to change it for you, but you can go out in your place and get the training you need to be more successful business people. Guy University offers some specific training towards this direction, and there's a whole lot of support in uh, many places to do that. So if you see that as a gap, great. This framework has been successful at showing you your next step and where to go. This gentleman, yes. Um, I've come to the conclusion that I'd rather reject the electrical So I'd like to talk to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> great. Yeah, sir. Just want to reflect a little bit on, on, on what you make for standards. Uh, Small one person enterprises can be regenerative and possibly e it's easier for them to be than, than, than larger organizations. And I, I get that, I understand that completely. Um, and up to a point, but just being conscious that when you're on your own, you've got to do everything. And it's much easier with partners than with allies. So it's uh, maybe you can get your mistake. Yeah, and I think I, I'll, I'll go a little further off of that. Thank you. Um, I think it's easier for one person enterprise or small enterprise to head towards having these characteristics. However, I am firm in the belief that a regenerative enterprise cannot exist on its own. Because if we look at ecosystems and take ecosystems as our guide and mimic, nothing exists on its own. And so uh, enterprises must be consciously engaged in ecosystems of other enterprises for that partnering, for that allying, uh, in order to actually develop and enhance all eight forms of capital. Um, that work, I think, is the edge of the world right now, in a way, is to step towards consciously designing enterprise ecosystems that, multi that optimize for eight forms of capital. Uh, and so that's a big invitation to all of you to be thinking on and working on. We're definitely working on it with on a larger scale, but I think it's up to a lot of folks in this room and elsewhere to figure out and um, grow the capability of groups of people to communicate well enough and design well enough, grasping disturbances all the way, um, regenerative enterprise ecosystems. Uh, lady in the back, yes. Uh, no. I would not do that. <laughs> that is not the way I'd start. I'd ask where's the greatest potential. Um, this is not a definition of regenerative enterprise. I've never said that, and I don't think so. Regeneration cannot be defined. Regeneration must be regenerated in the place with the people on an ongoing evolutionary basis. Um, 
This is the first time I've ever showed something like this, and I'll probably never show this exact thing again. I'll regenerate it based on the next people in place that were doing this. And you get to do that in your enterprise based on your situation. Because if we ever get stuck and think we're taking the best thing or the definition and taking it from one place and putting it somewhere else, that's the imperial mind. Yep. Right? That's the mechanical imperial mind stamping itself out all over the place again. It's hard to not do that, but I think it's a worthy um, goal to have. Jesse? Um, I think one of the aha moments that I got from you was when you said, this is copyrighted, uh, please don't just go and take this um, because um, it can be misconstrued when someone else delivers it um, again. And also you said that not every enterprise has to uh, produce all eight forms of capital. Um, because when I was first told about this uh, eight forms of capital, I believe it was from Permaculture Voices, uh, two down in San Diego, and uh, it was portrayed as um, every enterprise needs this uh, balanced, holistic eight forms of capital yeah. production model. And I was like, wow, that was, that's a lot that of really difficult in a lot of situations, you know? And, uh, and I think just from uh, my time, short time here looking at this, it's like, okay, well, um, if you are deficient in um, multiple forms of capital, how do you then uh, leverage the other ones to work with people that are going to fill those niches and um, find niches in other people's forms of capital that you can fill, and that's where you're going to create that web and network. And so yeah. that, that was really interesting. Yeah. Plus, the other thing about taking this is that this is, I don't know if you could explain this again. These are crazy words and kind of mixed together, and it'd be, it'd be nonsense if you shared it somewhere else. Uh, Okay, so let's see, I'm just checking the time. I'm happy to hear reflections or questions in general about the, the thing, and it may be that I'm not the best person to answer the question, and if that's the case, I'll just say that. And there's no way we're gonna get to all the questions with the hands up in the room, um, uh, which is fine, and we'll all get to talk afterwards. So this gentleman has had his hand up, so yeah. Um, you have a role in the traditional organization and current organizations is to measure Sorry, whose role is? Of an accountant. Uh huh. Yeah. Go ahead. A financial accountant and a cost account. Uh, how does this survive this new creative way of looking at Great question. That's a great question. Can you, can you repeat? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the accountant's traditional role is measuring and monitoring, especially financial capital. How is the accountant going to survive? survive? thrive uh, in this evolve <laughs> to work with uh, multi-capital accounting that's a great question um, I don't have a good answer for it um, except to say that uh, accountants are great at uh, systematizing and uh, measuring and um, we've had in my small permaculture business that I've had for 10 years in New York, we have done some initial work starting to measure and track different forms of capital. Uh, it's not complete, it's not exhaustive, but we know that, for example, 33% of all the income that comes into our little permaculture design install business is uh, of financial capital that comes in goes out into living capital in the forms of plants and people. Um, so we just started, started measuring that. I think a multi-capital accounting conference would be awesome. <laughs> it would be really fun to go to, and with the caveat that if anyone was in the uh, measuring permaculture before, there was a really great question that was asked at the end, which was basically said, um, Miguel Altieri of Agroecology published a paper saying, we have all the evidence available, we know all the systems, people were saying this this morning too, um, what is lacking to change things is political will. And so I don't want to get stuck in a place where we're spending all our time trying to measure and get metrics out the wazoo uh, and diverting that away from real strategy and, and leadership and operations. There needs to be a, a balance. Um, but yeah, lots of fun. I, if, if we want to start a multi-capital accountants group, mm -hmm. that would be lovely. There are people working on it. We're starting to work on it in Lush. They're starting to think about it. And their accountant got really excited when she saw the eight forms of capital framework and was like, cool. How do we, let's think about, figure out how to do this. How well, would you relate um, the working next door living without money or without money into the multi-coaching? Uh, I'm not in that workshop, yeah. so I don't know. <laughs> but but I, role or what role um, is there for? 
Uh, different frameworks, I would say. Different frameworks, different lineage of thinking. Uh, I think there's a lot of value in the moneyless direction. Um, I think there's a lot of value for personal growth and development. And I think I'm fascinated by gift economy work. Um, to me, personally, it doesn't look like uh, the most effective path to global systemic change. Um, I think it has a great amount of value, but I'm personally choosing to walk a different path. Um, I like money. <laughs> I love money, actually. It's great. Uh, I don't want to be a particularly financial capitally wealthy person, but I would love for millions and millions of dollars of financial capital to be flowing through me every year into living social, cultural, and spiritual capital. Um, so I think they both have value, and it's a very individual, personal choice where you go. With it. It's not exclusive to think of the, sorry. Go, answer. To think of the eight forms of capital without the financial capital, just to think of exchanges or an entire economy based on the seven forms of capital, right? That's you can apply that concept to that one. Rocket. Did you have a question also? Uh, no. <laughs> well, actually, I wanted to say one thing about the accounting. You, the great inspiration there could be the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, Report that were done. There's a lot of work about uh, measuring, uh, well, economic, yeah, economic evaluation of ecosystem services. And that could also apply to mm -hmm. other kind of forms of capital. So that's mostly applied to living capital. Mm -hmm. And that could also, same same methods that they use could also be applied to other yeah. capital. And I'll just, I agree. And there's another one mm -hmm. that I forget what it's called. There's a whole conference that's around it. One danger and worry, it's not a worry so much, it's just a risk to be aware of, is the collapsing of other forms of capital into financial capital of just being able to account for everything in terms of money, I think there's a real risk that we lose sight of the intrinsic value of the other ones and just think of everything in terms of, well, that marsh is worth you know $10,000, so we'll crush it and put $10,000 into a new plantation over here. Yeah. doesn't quite work. Um, but I, I think you're right that the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is a great start. Uh, I'm going to take two more. Uh, let me see. Woman in the back. Useful to repeat? Yeah. Okay, so the question was, was there a, a service company example um, as opposed to a product company? And then um, how, do you, how does this reconcile with the legal structures, especially in the United States, where companies have a, a legal requirement to create a financial capital bottom line for shareholders? Great. Thank you for those questions. Um, I'll just use uh, an example I know well, my little permaculture business that my wife, actually my wife's the CEO now and runs, called Appleseed Permaculture, which is very much a services business, does design consulting uh, and install work within 100 miles of home in the Northeast USA. Um, this has been a highly successful company in terms of financial capital and living capital and social and cultural <laughs> capital. Uh, I don't know if we necessarily are hitting all of those, but we're moving towards them. Uh, and I, I, yeah, like, like the gentleman before, I think there's a real opportunity for smaller scale companies and service to be using the frameworks uh, to think about it. Companies in the US with a legal requirement for financial capital bottom line, I'm learning and working with that now. My mentor, Carol Sanford, has tons of experience there and her belief is that no problem, you can grow financial capital profits by regenerating the earth. Um, and some of the companies she's worked with, like Seventh Generation, have shown that to me in some ways. Um, I still think we have a ways to go, and I think that that, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a significant, what I would call a restraint. And what we're getting here is a real activating force to regenerate the earth. And rather than figuring out how to compromise between those, I think we need to ask that question about potential rather than the problem, and, and say to everyone involved, what is the potential of how these two could be reconciled, and how can we design towards that together? That's all the time for questions. What I'd like you to do is um, please turn to a neighbor one more time, briefly, and I would like you to name one small, specific, achievable action 
that you might take arising from the thinking and work that we've done in this workshop? One small achievable action, just about two minutes each. Go for it. items from the from the group. Well I already had a web of a new well I believe is a is a regenerative network with the people that there's a new idea happening and in the town where I was working and so I will introduce them to these ideas. Lovely. In I will say your name but I will also introduce them in ways that are appropriate to the work that they're doing and where they're at. Something else. Brief. Uh, yeah, I've been thinking for some time about this, and it's basically to have a design trend of the enterprise ecology. So get all the people that are involved that already have enterprises or other organizations, because it can also be NGOs and uh, church groups, whatever, and actually have a design weekend for, for the enterprise ecology. Cool. All right, one more, and then I'm actually going to respond to what you're saying. It's really cool. Leora. Uh, so I have some questions about the next steps in Gai U, and it's connected with this. And so in our Gai U tent at the convergence, I'm going to put up some big sheets of paper and write some of these questions and let people uh, put their responses. I should also mention I'm a graduate of Gai University, um, which is which is part of what put me on this path to here. And uh, if anyone has thought about it and considered it, you should definitely do a degree with Gai U. And if you haven't thought about it yet. Then you should. <laughs> um, okay, I want to respond a little bit to a couple things. Uh, I, I humbly request that you don't run out there after an hour and a half talk and go tell everyone you have a regenerative enterprise. Uh -huh. um, it's, uh, it takes time and attention, and uh, it takes actually shifting the way our mind works, and 
if everybody goes out there and says it, it'll be very quickly to be greenwashed. Um, and so I invite you to explore the resources I'm gonna give you in a minute and start on a path towards figuring out what a regenerative enterprise is, but I don't want it to be a flash in the pot. And my experience is it's taken me three years working intensively, uh, 20 days, full days a year with somebody who's been doing regeneration for 40 years to get my mind even to the point where I'm starting to move towards and being able to share it like this. And it doesn't happen quickly in my experience. It may be different for you, but my invitation is slow and steady. Let's move towards it quietly until so we're actually really clear and we can all look at each other and hear the stories of our enterprises and be like, whoa, yeah, there it is. Because, uh, you know, if all the evidence in the world isn't enough, and if political will isn't changing, I believe what actually will shift things is when we can walk up to people who have successful financial capital businesses in the current world and say, so do I. And it produces living, cultural, social, spiritual capital in the midst of an ecosystem. And you can show them your books from the accountant, from your multi-capital accountant that's got your financial capital bottom line along with the others, and people from the business world can see and respect what we're doing and say, wow, okay, that's interesting. Because that's how the change will happen. That's how, in my experience, people in the financial capital and business world will shift if they can look at your balance sheet and see the reality, not just the big word of we're doing regenerative da 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 da, but actually um, show me the evidence. So that's an invitation to you to let, let's move towards this together, um, but don't go so fast and hot. That's my conclusion. Uh, here's some resources. Regenerative Enterprise, Gregory Landway, another guy, university graduate, uh, and I wrote this book two years ago. That's version 1.0. We're working on 2.0. Uh, Regenterprise.com. You can download the book as a gift uh, for free, or you can give a gift of financial capital in exchange. We're on Twitter. Um, we do, Terragenesis International does speaking and custom education. Um, whether it's basic permaculture training for your business or a corporation or a corporation you know that might be interested. Uh, we do uh, trainings on regenerative supply and on the creation of regenerative enterprise ecosystems. Um, One-off events don't work if you're shifting the structure of people's minds. Uh, it takes a commitment over time. So we're less interested in coming and doing a two-day training somewhere because it's not enough. We are interested in exploring uh, multi-year engagements at strategic locations with enterprises engaged to move us all towards regenerative enterprise. If you have a company, an enterprise, and would like to join the first 100 that we're working with in the next 10 years to shift a billion dollars of purchasing power into regenerative supply, um, we're busy. But you can get to us starting in November this year. Uh, Europe, North and South America, and Asia are easy. If we would see in other places in the world, talk to us and we can see what we can do. Um, Terragenesis has offices around the world. Um, and there's the contact info at terragenesis.com and on Twitter at, at Terragenesis. Thank you very much for coming. And come talk to me afterwards if you want to chat. <laughs>